morning. In November of 2019, we launched Home. Home is our initiative here to provide a down payment towards the purchase of a future property in San Francisco. Even though our church is just over 10 years old, we have already seen the strength that comes from having a long-term view and a long-term presence in a city that's so transient. Anybody seen that strength? Anybody glad when you showed up for your six months or what you thought was two years, we're going to turn it into 10, that there was a church here able to welcome you in as a tool just mentioned. But we really believe that securing our own property is going to allow Epic to really anchor in the city for decades to come. And today I want to tell you just where we are in that process because a few things in our world have changed since we started the home initiative. Anybody want to know like where we are? Is that still a thing? Um, did that home become something else? Um, on November the 17th of 2019, we had Home Commitment Day. And what went down on that day, in case you forgot it, or in case you're one of the hundreds of people who's joined with us since that day, on that day, hundreds of us brought one-time gifts along with a three-year commitment over and above our regular giving that would cover 2020, 2021, and 2022. And it was incredible for a church our size and as old as we were as a church to see us collectively commit $6.8 million towards that future property. But you know this, like it's easy to have a commitment. Anybody ever had a guy told you he had a commitment? But mm -mm. It's one thing to have a commitment. It's another thing to go, hey, are we going to live out that commitment? Well, today I want to tell you where we are towards that $6.8 million. As of last Sunday, September the 12th, here's where we are. $4.3 million has been given already. So way to go. Something to celebrate at home, celebrate here in the room. I just love that that, that is happening. Obviously, you can see that we're 63% uh, of the way there. You'll see that on the next slide, a little over 63%, so a little less than 37%. I know you guys are in school for a month, so you should be able to do that math, right? A little less than 37% remains, or right at $2.5 million. We are on track, we are on pace, and that is awesome with a little over 15 months to go till we wrap it up December the 31st, 2022. And you may also be wondering, like, okay, where are we in the process? A couple of questions you might have that I want to address real specifically is the first one, Ben, how has the pandemic changed our approach to the home initiative? Listen, everything in the world has shifted. Could we agree on that? But you know what hasn't shifted? Our belief that God wants to provide a city on a hill right here through Epic Church and a future property, having a stake in the ground in the city, unlike we've ever had before, that will pivot us into the future and really give us foundation into the future for, we think, decades to come. So I would say not only has it not changed at all, our mission has only deepened here because we believe what we're doing matters more now than it ever has, and we think that's going to be increasingly true in the future. And so I want you to know that our hearts haven't been moved uh, from the home initiative at all. The second thing you may wonder is, Ben, which areas, either in the city or outside the city are we considering? Well, we have tried to hold that open before God. For starters, let me just say our vision is to see an increasing number of people. So yeah, we're not going out of the city, okay? Love all of you who are watching online. Love that you're in all over the place. We know that you're in Europe and Asia and all the places we love, but we, we, and we want to come there, but we're going to be coming there out of this place being headquarters. So what neighborhood then we need to ask, are we considering? What are we open to? Which side of town are we open to? And let me be real honest with you. We have held this open before God, and God has yet to move our hearts or our vision outside of Soma. If you don't know our history, we got started at the W Hotel in February of 2011, and then we moved down the street to 543 Howard Street, August of the same year, and then we moved into this space, October the 12th of 2014. And so, guys, since our inception, we have had a long-term and faithful presence in Soma. We don't see that changing. If you were tracking with us over COVID, you know the first time we tried to do an outdoor service, we had it planned for December 6, 2020 in the Presidio, and God didn't even let us go out of Soma for one service. It got rained out in case you missed this. So surprise, surprise, when we did have uh, nine weeks of outdoor services, it was right here in, it was in Soma. And so, so far, and again, things could change. We are not presuming upon God, nor upon the city, nor upon the future. But what we can say effectively today is that our hearts and the vision hasn't been moved at all out of Soma. We believe that um, we need to continue to be a faithful presence here, and we believe that this really is a headquarter place to be in the center of San Francisco so that people like you who are coming in from all over the Bay Area can continue to do that, and wherever you are in the city, we believe you can continue to get here on Sundays, although it was race day. Anybody struggle with race traffic today? Yeah. Remember when traffic wasn't a thing, but nobody could come to church? 
we'll live with it. Um, we're just, we're just going to live with it. And, uh, and so those are a couple of things. But what I want you to do is begin imagining, in case you've gone to sleep and the pandemic has shifted things, begin imagining what it's going to be like to have this sacred space where we see hundreds, if not thousands, of kids and students step into their purpose and knowing who Jesus is and making him known. Uh, imagine what it's going to be like for you to get equipped to go lead in whatever your vocation is. One of the things that God's begun to put on my heart is a leadership college for us here at Epic. I'm excited about that. Seth and I are beginning to dream about what a school of worship housed in this new property would be like. And just think about it being not only refuge for our church community, but also for our city. People beginning to understand that God has a plan for their lives. Imagine what it might mean for our local partners, like Because Justice Matters, Bessie Carmichael School, to know that they will have not only a deeper partnership here, but a space that they can use for their purposes to be able to make a difference in the ways that God's called them to make a difference. So I am excited about this, and I want to ask you, like, how can you play your part? I'm going to give you a couple ways to play your part. For the hundreds of you who made a commitment, I just want to encourage you to, to give towards your commitment or to get back in the game of giving towards your commitment. Shauna and I, with the Home Initiative, we made the largest financial commitment we've ever made in our entire lives, except for having kids the largest financial commitment we've ever made in our entire lives. And I'm so grateful that we are already 86% of the way to fulfilling our commitment. We anticipate doing that long before the deadline. But wherever you are, get in it or get back in it. Secondly, if you're one of the hundreds of people who's joined us, jump in. Let's go. We are going to set up a long-term home for hundreds and we believe thousands of people to step into, not only to find Jesus, but to realize what he has called them to do with their lives right here in a city that they moved to that they might least expect to find Jesus. Anybody not expect to find Jesus, but you have since you moved here? Anybody at all? He is here. He's on the move. We're not going to buy the headlines. We're going to allow him to write a news story, whether people hear about it or not, that changes things in heaven, even if people on earth aren't aware of it outside of this city, okay? So that's what we're after. Let me give you another way to play your part is to pray. To pray. I hope you've been praying for home. We, we, we have been praying for this over two years already. But back in the spring of 2020, we were going to begin a series of prayer walks for home. Anybody know what happened in the spring of 2020? Literally the next Sunday, March 8th, which was the first of 68 normal Sundays we did not meet as a church, we were ready to hand you one of 12 different, I think, prayer cards on how you could pray. Well, we're going to pray this Saturday together. We're going to meet at the corner of First and Howard from 10 a, at 10 a.m., and we're going to break up, and we're just going to go all throughout the Soma neighborhood, and we're just going to be asking God, would you unlock the right place, the right building, the right address, right time, and at the right price? Guys, here's what we do believe. Anybody ever struggled to find housing in San Francisco? You think it's hard for you to try being a church in San Francisco? We believe that it's going to take divine intervention, but we also believe that God is ready to intervene. And yet scripture tells us you have not because you, you ask not. So we're, we've been asking, and if you are new to asking, come join us. We're going to meet at First and Howard, 10 a.m. Saturday, on the Chipotle side, right there at the corner. And we're just going to cover this neighborhood collectively in prayer, and we're going to keep doing that. You don't have to show up on Saturday, but we'd love for you to be in mass with us. Um, but you, as you're praying, as you're walking through Soma, please ask God to give us the space. Because here's what we know. We're still convinced that God has sent us to this place to see more people find Jesus and center their entire lives around him. And that's what we're after. I hope that 10 years from now, we're still after that. Long after I am not the pastor here, I hope you are still after that because that's what God has called us to do. And so let's double down and get on it. But here's the thing. We've not just been called to do that long term from now. We've been called to do that today. So let's get into the teaching. Have you ever been invited into something and you thought, how did I get invited into this? Like they've got the wrong person. Hey, you ever been there? You've got invited to something. You're like, how did I get invited into this? It's so special. You're so humbled. You're filled with gratitude. You soak in every moment of the dinner or the conference or the event or the meeting or the experience. But when those invitations become common and every day in your life, you don't mean to, but it's hard not to take it for granted. It's hard when those invitations just keep flowing. It's hard not to feel entitled, isn't it? Like, that's just human nature. Like, the first time someone invited me to go to this incredible game, it's like, that was awesome, but then they kept inviting me. I'm like, oh, now I expect it. And somewhere along the way, you never meant to, but you became entitled. It became commonplace. You began to take it for granted, and you lost the wonder of the invitation. 
Today, as we keep moving through the Gospel of Mark, I am praying and hoping that we will gain or that we will regain the wonder of the greatest invitation the world has ever known. Guys, I've been invited to some cool things. Anybody been invited to some cool things? You're invited to Epic. If you've never been invited to a cool thing, you're invited to come back next week. But let me tell you, the greatest invitation you and I will ever know is the one that we just sang about, that we've been invited to come to the Father. We have a Savior, if we sang about it in the second song, who comes seeking us. And today, I want us to remind ourselves or to hear for the first time afresh the greatest invitation you could ever be given in the entire world. So I want to go to Mark chapter 1, picking up where we left off, verses 14 through 20. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I want us to get into hearing this invitation, gaining or regaining the wonder of what exactly we've been invited into. And here we go in verse 14 of Mark 1. After John, that's John the Baptist we talked about last week, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. Say that with me. The time has come. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Today, may we gain, or may we regain the wonder of what it means, no matter your past, no matter your gender, no matter your nationality, no matter your age, no matter where you were this weekend, you have been invited to the most amazing thing ever. Have a seat. Let's figure out what it means to be invited and what in the world we do with what we've been invited into. So right out of the gate, again, if you weren't here last week, go back and catch up because we're walking through Mark over several months, and it's good to know where we've been. So where we were last week is looking at John the Baptist, and this week we learned that John was put in prison. You can read more about that in the other Gospels, but remember, Mark's just moving, getting to the point. John the Baptist was put in prison because he called out King Herod. Another time for that story, you can go and fill that in. Jesus shows up in Galilee, and he begins to preach the good news. We said last week, the reality of Jesus is the best news the world will ever know. The reality of Jesus, amen, yeah, I'm with you. It is the best news the world will ever know. Now, here's what I know. Last week, I told you, you're living in a good news, not a bad news kingdom, but I know that some of us received bad news this week. Anybody received some bad news this week? Just, just in our production meeting, I'm talking to one friend who is really struggling with their landlord and isn't able to find new housing yet. Talked to a, another friend who was out at dinner with his wife, and their car got broken into, and everything got taken. And, and, and so there's some bad news that went on this week, but I'm here to remind you, you ultimately still live in a good news kingdom. And the good news is showing up, and it is here, and it is true, but you might not see it as true. I mean, what good is the truth if we live like a lie is the truth? You've been invited into a good news kingdom. What's the good news in this moment from Jesus? The good news is this. The time has come. The time has come. So he's marking a moment. The time has come in which when you hear him say that, you should ask the question, Jesus, what time has come? What do you, what do you mean? In the New Testament portion of the Bible, it's written in Koine Greek in terms of the language that it was written in. But in the English translation, when you see the word time, it's just time, time, time. But you need to know there are multiple Greek words that give us our English word time. And you probably know these, or at least I think it might make sense after I tell you what they are. The first one is this, chronos. Chronos. You'll see this on the screen, but it refers simply to the passing of time. An hour went by, chronos. What you will do tomorrow at 3 p.m., Chronos, what we did yesterday during our Saturday, Chronos, time was just passing, it's just, just the math of time. Kairos, though, it is a different word for time, and Kairos means this, it refers to the right time, the opportunity for some event or action, an appointed time. Do you see the difference? And this is really important. In fact, it even the study even led me to have a conversation with my wife over the last day or so, just saying, hey, we've been thinking about this particular thing in our future in a, in a Kronos kind of way, but let's think about it in a Kairos way. 
Let's not be so calculated on the day and the time and the year and all the things. Let, let's get into the kairos. We want the right time, don't we? So those of you who walked in, this is not even in the sermon. I, don't, I hope it's from the Holy Spirit, please. It's not in the message, not in my notes, but so many of us are so well calculated that we miss the ka- kairos time. Anybody? I'm so chronologically occupied that I miss the right moment, the appointed moment. And what I want to say is, as a planner, God loves our plans, but we submit those to him. I think about James 5, just right off the cuff. I think about, oh man, what is coming to mind? Proverbs 16, you commit your way to the Lord, but the Lord's the one who established your plans. James 5, say this instead, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that, but if it's the Lord's will. We want the Kairos moment, don't we? Oh man, Will, you know this, man, I've been well prepared. What I've, been, what I've been begging God for, what's the chronos? What's the chronos? What's the chronos? He's like, Ben, I've got a kairos. I've got a right moment. I'm going to step you guys into this property at just the right time. Oh, man. All right, let me get back to the notes that I did learn. <laughs> kairos. So when Jesus says the time has come, here's what he's saying. This is the appointed time. This is the moment for the kingdom of God to be ushered in. All of the prophecies that you Jews are familiar with, it is being, they are being fulfilled in me. The time has come. Most Jews at this moment believe that the kingdom of God was a far-off future reality. And Jesus says the thing that was way out there is now right here. But here's the thing. Even when they began to understand the kingdom of God is here, they always believed that the kingdom of God would be a political power. They believed it would be a political power. Reign. They believe that it would be a political kingdom. It sound familiar? Group of people putting their hope in politics. Anybody out there? Lord, help us. Really. So imagine that you're in Israel. And imagine that you hear the kingdom of God is coming. And imagine that you think it's a political kingdom. And imagine you've been subdued and, and, and just had to submit to Rome. What do you think you would think? with the kingdom of God showing up. We're going to overthrow Rome. I mean, it's this great empire, but we have this promise. And so when Jesus shows up, he's telling them this is not a political kingdom. This is a spiritual kingdom. This is not a political reign. This is a spiritual reign. And in this kingdom, I am the king. In this kingdom, Jesus is just saying, like, I am the king. Well, how how do you get into the kingdom of God? What's required? It's right here in the text. You repent, believe the good news, and follow Jesus wherever he goes. We've made it so complicated. You repent, you believe the good news, and you follow Jesus wherever he goes. That's what it means. So let's break these down. Repent. Repent. Here's what repent means. A change of mind that results in regret and a change in conduct. You're going to hear this all the time through the Gospels. Repent, a change of mind that results in, I'm sorry, God, for what I have been doing, and it is a result in conduct. It is not the kind of sorrow that when I was a kid and I got in trouble, I'm like, I'm so sorry, Mom, but I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow and the day after that, right? No, no, no. A change of mind that results in regret and a change in conduct. Repent. And then believe the good news. This is really important. When Jesus says believe the good news, he does not say believe that I existed. He is not saying, do you like my teaching? He is not saying, do you think my morals were above the average in this day and time? He's saying decisively put your trust in me as Lord. Decisively. So I want to ask it in a question form to you. Have you decisively put your faith in Jesus as Lord and King? Now, there's a place here at Epic for you to seek, and you're so welcome. You should come to Alpha this Tuesday. Sign up today if you're a seeker. But what happens for so many of us, we get close to the line of faith, and we find all kinds of reasons to just keep putting off that decision ultimately. Oh, I'm just not sure. Uh, Oh, what if he asked me to do something hard? And some of you, you've got to this place where all of your questions have been answered and you just keep asking the same ones. And if you need to genuinely ask questions, this is the right place for you. But some of you, you're like, oh, I just, like, I don't know. Some of you, like, you, you just struggle in life with commitment. And so in your faith life, it's the same. And what I'm asking you today is, is today the day that you decisively step over the line of faith? Like, I am settling this once and for all. And again, keep seeking. But some of you, you're at that place 
And it's decision time, and I want to encourage you to do what Jesus said, because you don't want to miss out on the invitation. Jesus isn't going like, hey, you can kind of be in and kind of be out. You need to decisively believe the good news, and it is good news. It's really good news. So in the kingdom of God, you need to ask the question, um, who gets into the kingdom? As in, what kinds of people are invited to have a life of following Jesus? We all do this, right? Like, if, if you're going out for a job, you want to know what kind of person are they, what are they looking for, right? When you apply to university, you want to know whoever's going to make that admissions decision, what kind of student are they looking for? So if you're going to get into the kingdom of God and follow Jesus and, and, and want to know about is his invitation for you, you want to know what kind of man or woman or boy or girl is Jesus looking for? And I've got such good news with that question. He's looking for humans. Like, Ben, do they have to be accomplished? No. Like, Ben, how do you know? Look at our example. He goes to two sets of brothers who are fishermen. They're Jewish. Two sets of brothers who haven't been chosen by any other rabbi. Two sets of brothers who, by default, like many people would do in this day and time, by default, they take on their father's trade. There's nothing inherently special about these men. They will be called later on in life ordinary, uneducated men. So if that's you or anything is you, you fit in. But he comes to them and he says, hey, follow me. And they have to leave things behind to follow Jesus. Here at Epic, we're always gaining clarity on what is God's part and what is our part. With the invitation we're discussing today, Jesus' part is to invite you. Follow me. Your part is to say yes and to follow. Again, we make it so complicated. But if we would just follow him, so many things in our life would be taken care of. If we would just follow him. Now, I want to give you one other text from Mark chapter 3, another scene where we have the holistic calling of the disciples in Mark 3, 13 through 19. Like, no, we're not skipping chapter 1 and chapter 2. I'm just combining the topic. In chapter 3, I want you to hear how this goes down. 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. I'm just going to give their English name, Sons of Thunder. (laughs) Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. First thing I don't want us to miss, because if you go into, here's the thing, if we go into the Mark study over the next several months, and we're just trying to find historical facts, they are there, and we are going to point them out. But I want to make sure we don't miss what's inherent, because what you see in this moment with Jesus and those original 12 disciples, it's still the way Jesus is doing the disciple thing. Okay, so this isn't like a one-off. What he does here, so the first thing I want you to get, and you're going to hear a lot of passion rise in my voice, is just a three-word statement. Jesus wants us. Jesus wants us. Did you hear what I said in the text? He's on a mountainside. This is where his preference was often to spend the night praying to his father, talking to his father. He's on the mountainside, and it says what? He called those he, he wanted. Jesus wants us, which means Jesus wants you, and he wants you, and he wants you, and he wants you, and he wants me. The company might not want you any longer, but Jesus wants you. Your ex-husband may have abandoned you, but Jesus wants you. I'm going to fix this mic because you got to hear me, okay? Your parents may want nothing to do with you, but Jesus wants you. I know that these things hurt, but you need to settle it in and come say with David in Psalm 27, verse 10, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. I know it hurts. We are here for you. We're not dismissing those emotional realities, but you need to know that the Lord of heaven, the king of the universe, wants you. Wants you. Fully wants you. I hate rejection. Anybody else? No, I mean I hate being even rejected by my dog. Anybody? 
Like, I just, I hate rejection. But you know what overshadows a life of rejection or being forsaken? Is knowing that the God of the universe has chosen you. The God of the universe has chosen you. <clears throat> Should I use the mic up here, Chad? Which one? Awesome, man. Sometimes, you know, you got to get with it with a handheld anyway. The God of heaven wants you. I wish what I could do for my kids and what I could do for you is tell you, you're not going to be rejected by anyone in the future. You're not going to be forsaken. What I'm here to tell you is, hey, let's sit in that pain. Let's let God come in in that pain, but let's find some noble purpose to overshadow that pain, which is this. Jesus wants you. Like, Ben, does he want me because he has no choice? No, he wants you because he loves you. Ben, I'm not worthy. His love is going to make you worthy. Ben, do you know who I am? He's well acquainted with who you are, but he's more convinced of who you're going to become. He doesn't call Peter a rock after Peter gets his act together and leads the first church. He calls him a rock long before he becomes that person. He wants you. But you know how desire works. It's got to be a two-way street. He wants Judas, but Judas, Judas ultimately doesn't want him. So the question isn't, is Jesus going to play his part and invite me? It's, am I going to play my part and follow? And a question that you should be asking is, Ben, what's the difference between a Christian, which I am, I think, and a disciple? That seems big time. Ben, what's the difference between a follower of Jesus and someone who apprentices under him? That one seems challenging. You ready for this? There's no difference. If you're a Christian, you're a disciple. If you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. You're like, Ben, that hurts. That's the best news you could hear today if somebody's told you something else. There, there's no follower of Jesus without a disciple. So, so we need to know, what does it mean to be a disciple? To be a disciple of Jesus means we live with him and we do whatever he tells us to do in his power. We live with him. Look at Mark 13, 13 through 19. We live with him. He appointed the 12 that they might be what? With him and that he might send them out. So we do what he calls us to do and that they would have authority to drive out demons. So those three components we want to center in on as we evaluate our own discipleship or apprenticeship or how we're doing as students of Jesus. Are you living your life with Jesus? Are you living your life with Jesus? Go to John 15, not today, but like if you want to know, am I doing this? You're going to see like, hey, you are the vine, I am the branches. Je uh, I'm the vine, you are the branches, Jesus is going to say. Jesus is going to tell you that you're meant to dwell in me and have my words dwell in you. Are you living your life with Jesus? Number two... Are you obeying what Jesus has told you to do? Are you obeying, right? You're like, Ben, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to obey him. I'm like, um, that's what he meant. Are you obeying what Jesus has told you to do? And number three, this is a big one for me, even when I get the first two right. Are you living your life in his power or just in your own strength? I am not saying that the life of a disciple is an easy life, but it gets easier when we're not doing it on our own. When we're empowered, as we learned this summer, by the Holy Spirit, we're able to actually be with Jesus and do the things that Jesus has told us to do, but not in our own power, in his. And in this incredible that Mark's telling us something you'll see over and over and over again for true disciples, they get the authority of Jesus. They get the authority of Jesus, which is incredible. I was listening to a podcast this summer, um, it was the Rebuilders podcast with Mark Sayers. Mark is a brilliant mind pastor at Red Church in Melbourne, Australia. And he had a guy he was interviewing whose name is Rob Reimer. And they were talking about spiritual authority. And the first thing Reimer did that I thought was really helpful for me is he just defined the word authority. Here's what he said. Authority is simply this, the right to use someone else's power. Does that make sense? It's the right to use. So, so if moms and dads, if you get a babysitter... You're giving that babysitter what? Your power. Now, again, you tell them where they don't have your power, but you're, you're giving them the authority, right? Um, Anthony leads our student ministry. Um, Will and I, as pastors here, we're giving you the authority to lead these students. We're giving you the, the right? But when Jesus gives us his authority, that means we can do what he's called us to do in his power. That's how he was able to say later, you're going to do even greater things than I did. So spiritual authority is the right for us to use Jesus' power. 
which is so good, right? Which means I'm not just on my own. And the problem is, most of the people who think they are powerful in a worldly way, they will continue to think in their spiritual life that they've got to be independent as well. And they're like, Ben, there's no strength in my spiritual life. There's no fruit in my spiritual life. I feel so weak in this area. Listen, let's grow in it, but we need the power of God. You're not on your own, my friend. And he also said, Reimer did about spiritual authority. He said, it's the capacity to touch heaven and change outcomes on earth. I love that. So as you evaluate, like, where are you in that mix? And then another thing you see from Jesus calling these 12 that you've got to know is this. Jesus calls people to follow him who are just like you and people who are nothing like you. What do you mean? I mean, he calls people from the right and the left. I mean, he calls people who have a different outlook on how they are following Jesus maybe than you do because he's got something else for them. I mean that he calls Peter and John. Right? Peter, after resurrection, he's like, what do you have for John? And Jesus is like, listen, you follow me. Let me do with John what I want to do with John, but you follow me. That's what I'm going to do with you. Guys, who would put these 12 together? (laughs) I mean, you've got some cowards. Most of them walk away from Jesus at some point. You've got extroverts and introverts. You've got hot-headed Peter. You have Thomas, the skeptic. Right? You have, my gosh, you have a zealot. Like, what does that mean? Ben, I read the fiction book. Is it the same thing? A zealot is someone who was anti-Rome and was trying to be part of a revolution. Jesus calls that one. And, and, and you know this, he, he calls a traitor. And when you understand the invitation of Jesus by looking at these first 12 disciples and see the church that he's trying to build, unfortunately, we, too many people in the name of Jesus get in the way of what he's actually trying to build, but that's a whole different thing. Jesus is still calling people who are very different from each other. He still is. And here's the the great news for every one of us. In this way, the invitation of Jesus is radically inclusive. Aren't you glad? It doesn't matter. But see, when you realize that it includes you, then you've got to realize it includes everyone else. There's a lot of talk today in our culture, even specifically here, and I think a lot of it is good about inclusion. I think inclusion is a very important thing. But again, we have to define our terms. So when it comes to the gospel message, the good news of Jesus, who is it for? Radically inclusive. But when it comes to what is the message? Radically exclusive. Ben, is it inclusive or exclusive? Yes. The invitation is radically inclusive. The message, what the invitation is, what you're being asked to respond to, radically exclusive. So, Ben, you mean there's no you do you in this kingdom? No you do you. Nope. You mean, Ben, um, how do, how, like, because we live in San Francisco and, you know, for me to be able to kind of be welcomed in at the workplace, doesn't it mean that I only follow in this part and that part? No, no, it, it means everywhere. Be wise and winsome with how you follow, but it means everywhere. You mean, Ben, I don't just get to tell Jesus what we're doing and ask him to bless it since he can do that? No, no. The invitation is radically inclusive. You're invited in, and you're invited in, and you're invited in, and you're invited in. But the message, the response, is radically exclusive. You mean, Ben, I follow Jesus, but I can do whatever I want to with my body? No. No, you're a disciple. Ben, I follow Jesus, but I can do whatever I want to with my money? No, you're a disciple. Ben, I can be the, whatever kind of husband or whatever kind of wife I want to be. No, you are a disciple. What about leadership, Ben? Disciple. Or, or are you not? One other thing I want to give you that you see with the disciples when they get called is this. To fully follow Jesus, you will have to leave something that's familiar to you. You're like, Ben, yeah, I remember when I did that that one time. <laughs> when I started following I had to leave my life of sin. Let me tell you this. You'll see it all throughout the Bible. You'll see it all throughout my life. And if you look over the last 20 years, for me to keep following Jesus, I had to keep leaving familiar things. It may be a habit. It might be a vocation. It might be a relationship. It might be a way of life. It might be an ideology. In Luke chapter 5, verse 11, he gives us kind of what happened for all the disciples in this moment. In Luke 5, 11, Luke just writes, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. If you're going to follow Jesus, whether you're 13 or 63 in this room, you're going to reach these moments, these seasons, where for you to keep following, you've got to leave and walk away from what was familiar. 
Are you willing to do that? Maybe a better question is, is he worth it? Is Jesus, like really, is Jesus worth it? Here's what I'm going to do to end our time. I want to recap this message by focusing on four areas that you've just heard. And I want you to be thinking, as I recap, the band's going to go ahead and come up. We're going to lower the lights a bit. I want you to think about which of these four areas is yours. And then after I recap these four areas, we're going to pray for every person in this room as you stand for the area that you know God is telling you something about. It will reveal nothing specifically to anyone in this room. It's just we all have one of these areas. And I want to pray that God would come and do the work that he needs to do. So the first area is this. Are you at a place where it's time to finally be decisive with your faith in Jesus? You need to be decisive with your faith in Jesus. The second area that we talked about is this. Is today the day that you need to be finally and fully convinced that he wants you? Just convinced that he wants you. That you're wanted by the Lord of heaven, by the King of the universe. Thirdly, is it time to engage that discipleship thing that God is asking you to get engaged with? Maybe it's the living with Jesus, or it's the doing what he's told you to do, or it's the doing it in his power. And then the fourth thing that we just talked about is, do you know that you're up against a moment that for you to keep following Jesus, you have to walk away from something familiar? So we all have an area. Let's just be honest about that. Some of you are like, Ben, I need to stand for all four. You can, but I just want you to pick one. So if today is a day for you where you know, hey, I'm in a season where I need to be a little more decisive about my faith, would you stand so I could just pray for you? Anybody in the house that just knows, hey, I need to be a little more decisive. Go ahead and stand. Awesome. Awesome. And so, Lord, for every person who's standing and everyone who's watching at home that knows that's the one for them, would you give them the courage And would you clear the path for them to step into this decisive faith? Jesus, I hope they know in this moment that you're patient, that you're kind. But you also, you have things for them that they will not be able to unlock until they decide to step into faith in you. And so I pray today that they would do that. You may be seated. The second category, and I know many of you just from hearing your stories, like maybe there's been a relationship where you've been rejected or you've been forsaken or you've been left out or just when you think about God you you find it so hard to believe that he would want you because you're so familiar with you and you've heard some things about him and you're not sure how they go together but if today you need to be convinced that Jesus wants you would you stand so we can pray for you I just need to be convinced that Jesus wants me he actually wants me thank you So Jesus, I pray that as we think about what we've experienced, as we think about our mindset, as we think about our past, as we think about how we feel far from you, would you convince those standing or watching or seated but aren't ready to stand that you love them, that you want them, and that they could say, though the boss, though the ex, though my friends might forsake me, the Lord will receive me. God, would you seal in their hearts that they belong to the the king of the universe? You're chosen. You may be seated. A third category, you're in some area of life where you know in that discipleship reality, maybe it's life with Jesus. Maybe it's doing what he's called you to do. Maybe it is making sure you do it in his power. Would you stand? And I'm standing in this one with you. Would you stand and go, hey, that's me. That's what I need to engage. It's, it's, it's where I'm at. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would show us what it means to dwell with you. We hear that talk, but what does it mean? Jesus, I pray that those of us standing, we would make space. We would hear from you. We would think about what you've said, even from the word today. The time has come. The kingdom is here. What does that mean for me? Secondly, Jesus, would you help us to do what you've called us to do? Would you help us to do what you've called us to do? And then thirdly, would you help us to do it in your power and in your strength? Could we use your spiritual authority to do the things that you've called us to do? You can be seated. And then fourth, you're in a moment or you're in a season where you just know that for you to keep following him, you've got to walk away from something that is so familiar. It's a habit. You know, it's not good for you, but much like the Israelites when they were freed from Egypt, you're trying to go back to it. And he's, he's going, no, I want you to move on from here. What I have for you can't be in you until you leave this behind. Maybe there's a relationship. Maybe there's an environment thing. Maybe there's a way you use your time. But he's, he's calling you to leave something familiar so that you can fully follow him. If that's you... You're in a season where you have to leave something familiar. Would you stand so I can pray for you? Awesome. Yeah. 
And I just want to say for those of you standing, this will be a pattern, but every moment it's going to be hard. It's going to hurt. And uh, just for some reason, for those of you standing here, here's what I want to say. It's okay to grieve the end of a season, a friendship, a vocation, a city, even to grieve a habit that's become a companion, even though it might not be healthy for you. But I want you to know, it's hard to believe now, that on the other side of you letting go of what has been, there's so much beauty, so much blessing, and there's so much more of Jesus. So, Jesus, hearing clearly from you in this moment, I pray that you would give these men and women and boys and girls the power to walk away from what has been, from what's been maybe appropriate for a season but is now holding them back. I pray that you would free them from what was familiar and help them step into this next season you have. And even as they let go of one thing, and that feels so scary that they would see you there going, come on, come to me. You can trust me. I'm worthy of your faith. And for all of us, Lord, for all of us, convince us in this moment that you're worth following, that we've been invited in. But what we've been invited into, it makes this beautiful glorious demand on our lives. And it's still the best news the world will ever know, which means it's the best news we will ever know. Come and seal this for us as we worship and respond in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand and join these people. Let's continue to commit our...